Great. So I think that we are now streaming live as well as recording the evening's talk. So really warm welcome to everybody who's joining from Facebook, <laughs> the wicked Facebook, but it all depends how we use these things. And uh, this evening's talk, Little Dhamma Reflection, is going to be on confidence. So yesterday, I gave a little overview of the five indriyas or spiritual faculties, and um, they're really the things that empower and strengthen the mind and, and determine the speed, the efficacy, and the depth of the path, how long it takes us to get enlightened. If it's not working, check out your spiritual faculties, see if any one of them is weak. So, and sila, the topic of yesterday, is obviously a foundation for everything else that we do on the path. So this is strengthened and um, gives strength and imparts a lot of um, depth and stability, I would say, to all the other indriyas, to the five indriyas. So today we're going to talk about confidence, one of my very favorite subjects. And I think uh, it's important to understand that inspired confidence or confidence in the Buddha's teaching is quite different from belief in some other religions. It's likened to a strong rope that holds the ship, maybe a shipwreck, to its anchor in a storm. So it can really keep us steady, especially when we're facing inner storms or inner turmoil in our life. And if you think about faith or confidence and imagine how life would be if you didn't have that at all, you know, there wouldn't be a lot of meaning if there was nothing to believe in, nothing worth holding sacred and revering in life or in our hearts. <clears throat> So we need something to aspire to, something to um, lead the mind onward and to give us the patience necessary to really cultivate this path and take it through to its end. So I think that confidence is also closely related to patience, perhaps that patience arise, arises from confidence, depending on how much you have. And it's also very interesting to note in the Buddha's teaching that the cause, the um, prerequisite in a sense for developing really deep confidence in the teachings and the aspiration to walk on the path is, guess what? It's actually suffering. And that is taken straight from the suttas, from the Upanisha Sutta that says that one who experiences suffering basically um, generates confidence in the path and the missing link between these two of course is hearing the Dhamma teachings and learning to start investigating those Dhamma teachings um, at least enough confidence to take that first preliminary step on the path so I know from my own experience that suffering and realizing that you know I needed to find a deeper meaning in my life, really something to aspire to, something worth committing wholeheartedly to in my life, um, came from a sense of dissatisfaction, a sense of suffering, a sense of feeling that the things society was teaching me that I should aspire to were actually not going to be enough. You know, my family had a comfortable standard of living. They were very good people. I was doing well at school and I had a lovely best friend who's now one of my trustees. So we remained friends for life since the age of four. And, you know, on the outside, there was nothing wrong in my life. And yet there was this big kind of question mark and a big kind of empty hole that I felt needed filling with something. And nothing in our society was calling to me with anything that made sense. So it was really through hearing the teachings of the Buddha and then entering my first retreat where I was actually working with my own mind and seeing how suffering and happiness arise within. You know, of course, there are certain situations externally that we would always want to avoid. You know, as I was saying to Ajahn Brahm earlier, um, sometimes, you know, we have to be careful not to measure ourselves against others because our conditions may be quite different from the optimum conditions necessary to develop on the path. And that's not a personal failing, you know, we shouldn't take that as the being something wrong with ourselves, but rather we should endeavor to try to change those conditions and to try to learn which conditions can lead to wholesome states. But generally speaking, we, we learn when we practice that suffering and happiness are an inside job. Yeah, we can respond to life in ways that increase 
um, a sense of discontent, even despair and grief and all kinds of other things, like even exacerbate physical pain when we resist it or when we um, get consumed by it to the extent that we're not able to experience anything but that pain. And equally, happiness, the causes for happiness and the capacity for happiness lies inside this human heart with all its incredible potential. So for me, when I did my first retreat, I knew that I'd found something worth giving my life to, something that I didn't want to let go. I felt that there was so much to explore and discover. And I made a commitment in my first retreat to basically give as much energy and time in this life as I possibly could to developing the path. And yet patience is such an important factor on that path for me as well, because, and I think the confidence um, strengthens the patience, because if we are wise about the causes that we put in place, and we understand that, you know, the results will arise in their own time, according to the causes and conditions, then we have more capacity to allow the time to ripen and not to demand a quick result. Yeah. So that sadha, that confidence can keep us going even when things don't seem to be working or even when sometimes we might seem to be going backwards on the path. Yeah, sometimes that can be the case even for me. So sometimes it's helpful for a teacher to admit that and express that because we're no different from you, you know. Sometimes I've had wonderful conditions in my life and I've had 18 hours to practice every day. And even in those six hours of sleep, I didn't really need the sleep. You know, I was mindful. I could experience many sensations, even in a sort of semi-sleep state and, and stay balanced and aware. And there are other times in my life when the emphasis is on service and I work many hours a day at a desk. It's almost as many hours on the desk as I was before on the cushion in the tropics of Burma in uh, extreme humidity and austerity. And it's a different kind of suffering. There's no physical suffering involved in the same way, but it's a kind of, I could make a lot of suffering out of it if I wish to be somewhere else. Or I can learn to care for myself even while I'm working. And this is an ongoing learning job. And also to realize that I'm still practicing the path, yeah? Whatever we're doing in life, we can align it with the Eightfold Path, whether it's meditation, where we're conscientiously developing sati, samasati and samasamadhi, based on the other factors of the path, or whether we're in our daily life, focusing on right speech, right action, right livelihood, yeah? Also right effort, if you like, right endeavor, seeing how we can do little acts of kindness for each other that bring more happiness to each other's lives. And of course, all of this depends on right view, which again is one of the causes for confidence, seeing that suffering is an inevitable intrinsic part of life. And not only seeing that, but understanding that because this suffering can be um, generated or um, exacerbated, by the way we behave, that our actions have consequences for ourselves and for others. And this is what's meant by understanding the law of cause and effect. So the two main factors of right view are understanding the four noble truths, even at the preliminary level, because we're not perhaps stream enterers yet, and also having some appreciation that actions have effects. And there's an ethical aspect to all our actions of body, speech, and mind whether they're aligned with kindness, compassion, making peace, letting go of self-interest, for example, near Kama, or whether they're based on aversion, cruelty, even a lack of gentleness can come under that cruelty or a lack of patience as well, yeah? So this sadha that I like to translate as inspired confidence can be in the qualities of the Buddha, Dhamma and the Sangha, as our refuge, but it can also be even more powerful when we understand that our task, our job is to internalize those qualities. So to actually experience and develop those qualities within ourselves, our own seeds of awakening. Yeah, the Buddha had immense compassion and wisdom for all beings. So even if we say we're 
the Buddha's disciple, but we're developing, you know, hatred towards someone from another religion, or we're developing more of a sense of self or nationalism through being Buddhists, we're not really developing compassion and wisdom to all. And the Buddha's compassion, the Buddha's loving kindness was completely unconditional and impartial. So it didn't matter which race or gender or sexual orientation you were from. The Buddha was actually a great social activist who broke down boundaries, who broke down barriers between people and who broke down boundaries and barriers in our own hearts. And then, of course, we have the Dhamma. The Dhamma is the teachings of the Buddha, but it's also where those teachings are pointing to. So the Dhamma is the truth, the ultimate truth. And that is something to be directly experienced. And isn't it wonderful to know that there's a path there's an actual path that we can walk. Because for me, you know, it wasn't very impressive to hear, for example, from traditional Christian teachings, although my family weren't particularly religious, still that infiltrated, you know, one should not do this, thou should not do this. And it's like, okay, but you know, everyone who is say an alcoholic knows very well that, you know, drink is not helpful, drink is harmful for them. You know, they shouldn't take another drink. But how can they actually restrain? How can they refrain from that if they're addicted? So for me, the Buddhist path gives the how, not only the what to do, but how to do it by training the mind, training the heart. And we learn on this path that it is possible because the mind is malleable. The mind can be trained. And the Buddha said, if it wasn't possible to train and develop wholesome states, I would not ask you to do that. But because it is possible, I ask you to train and cultivate wholesome states of mind. So the mind is not fixed, just as the body is not fixed. It's changing all the time. And that gives a sense of real liberation and possibility to all of us. Of course, also we can have confidence in the Sangha. And by the Sangha in this context, it really refers, whenever the Buddha uses that term, to the monastic Sangha of bhikkhus and bhikkhunis. It can also refer to anybody who's attained the first stage on the path, so stream entry, and who's basically seen through the delusion of self, has seen it deeply into the Four Noble Truths in a way that means they can never commit any kind of karma anymore that can take them to the lower realm. And it's a very high attainment. Basically, once you're a stream winner, you're assured of full Nibbana, full enlightenment. So it's a radical shift in view. And for myself, having been fortunate to be around a number of people, just less than, you know, a handful, <laughs> but still a number of people throughout my time in Thailand, India, and also Myanmar, and maybe other country, one other country too. <laughs> um, because of this, I consider myself so incredibly fortunate. And it really was the first time that I met somebody who was, uh, a stream winner and who was known to be and whose whole demeanor and understanding and depth of teaching made it very clear that I really understood the power of having such a teacher and the power of the Sangha to inspire because these are human beings who are living and breathing today and these are human beings who just like us had the same delusions they had the same struggles perhaps a little bit different one of them was my teacher in Myanmar and he was a monk has to be said from the age of five so one of the obvious features there is that he had perfect virtue throughout his whole life right you know he hadn't even engaged in relationships or any of not that that's unvirtuous but it certainly can disturb the mind or take you on a different course in life so his whole life was just directed for one purpose only and just to be around the immense peace and kindness and and compassion that such a person radiates is really transformative it's almost as though their qualities start to rub off on us and of course, that's important because the point is not just to revere it in someone else. The point is to see that this is the outcome of practice. This is a cause and effect process. Yeah. And just as Ajahn Brown was touching on that lovely analogy earlier about flowers, you know, a rose blooms when a rose blooms, not when an elderflower blooms. <laughs> I had a similar um, analogy that occurred to me in, in Perth one year when I was on retreat at Jana Grove. 
normally I spend every Ames retreat there with Ajahn Brown. I ordained, fully ordained over there after many years in Burma and also back in Europe. And then finally, after eight years of monastic life, I got the full ordination, which is also about eight years ago. So 16 years, but eight years preparation, <laughs> which is very different for, for nuns than it is for monks. Um, so usually I spend my rains there and the rains retreat period goes through the winter and into the spring. And in the winter, there are all these bushes everywhere, really scraggy, kind of prickly, not very inspiring shrubs and bushes. You know, when you're walking about, you have to be careful not to get picked or not to. Um, yeah, I mean, you just don't really even see them often because they're quite low lying and they just look kind of uh, spiky and, and nothing particularly pretty. But suddenly in the spring and around August, they all start getting these gorgeous little flowers and the kind of flowers you would never imagine coming from such an ugly scrubby little bush. And what I noticed was that they start blooming almost like an orchestra. You know, in an orchestra, you start off with one instrument or two instruments, then the next kind of lot of instruments come in at a certain time, on time, and then the next kind of instrument come in. Actually, I don't know anything about orchestras, but I'm guessing that's sort of what happens. <laughs> um, and it was the same with these bushes. Like you, you would see one and you say, wow, I shouldn't have underestimated this bush. The flowers are so beautiful, but that one over there, that's hopeless. That's not blooming at all. But four or five days later, all of those bushes start to bloom and suddenly yellow flowers everywhere, everywhere. And then suddenly a few days later, orchids start to bloom and you realize, wow, that little kind of leaf that was sticking up from the stones was actually a beautiful orchid waiting to bloom. And I realized the sort of um, ignorance of ever judging ourselves against anybody else because everything blooms in its own time. Everything blooms when it's the season for it to bloom. And at that time, it's really astounding. They bloom in completely unexpected ways. So Perth and Western Australia in the spring season is absolutely stunning. And the trick is not forgetting that that's how it is when the winter comes, <laughs> right? Because when there's a winter, we think, oh my goodness, what happened to my practice? Like I used to be happy, now I'm suffering and now I can't even watch the press, but it doesn't matter. It's just not the springtime right now. Now it's the time for hibernation. Keep on, you know, having confidence, keep on walking the path and let the time ripen. The time will ripen when the mind has enough sunshine and warmth, you know? So I think it's also very important not only to have confidence in the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, but also to have confidence in oneself, in our own capacity to be taught, to put the teachings into practice, and also to see them through, to see them through to completion as far as we can. Yeah, I always keep in mind Bhikkhu Bodhi's comment. It's kind of one of my favorite quotes. He says, there's only two things required for enlightenment. One is to start walking on the path. And the second one is to continue. So simple, right? <laughs> and it doesn't mean you're continuing every waking moment because that's really impossible. But it is the fact that every moment of awareness is like another drop of water in a huge water tank. As long as you plug up the leaks in that tank, <laughs> you know, there's no water dripping out of the bottom through a lack of sense restraint or a lack of virtue, then every moment of mindfulness will fill up that tank. Yeah, so your virtue, your sense restraint, your goodness, the beautiful qualities that you develop in your life are the things that keep that tank intact so that whatever you add on will just be accumulating. And the thing is with these water tanks is that they're too high for us to look inside. We can't see how much water's in there. You know, it might be just about to flow over. It might be only just starting to fill, but it doesn't matter because eventually it will overflow. And also, you know, all of you may not think you have that much confidence. I don't know. Maybe some of you have a lot of sadha, a lot of devotion and faith, but it was devotion. It was confidence that brought you to this retreat, right? Because there was something you felt that was worth trying. So there was enough confidence there to take the first step. 
And that can be seen as preliminary confidence or inspired confidence, which later along the path gets verified through our direct experience. <clears throat> and it leads all the way throughout this path to the point of becoming unshakable. And that is the point of stream entry when your confidence in the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha is completely unshakable because you've seen the same truths that the Buddha saw, that the enlightened monks and nuns and lay people, lay women, lay men have seen since, and also lay gender non-binary people, <clears throat> because I'm sure non-binary people or trans people always existed, even in the time of the Buddha. So we shouldn't go into too much binary. So some of the qualities that Sada brings to the heart. And the first one I was thinking about was that it gives us a direction. You know, it shows us how to walk on the path and it gives us the inspiration to take those steps and to keep walking. Yeah. The second really important thing is the emotional element of Sada. Yeah. It is something that sort of moistens the path. It softens the mind, it softens the heart. A heart without confidence, without devotion or reverence is very brittle. You know, it's easily affected when things go wrong in life. It's kind of like a cup made of really fine china. Even if that china's fine and beautiful, if you drop it on the floor, it just cracks. Yeah, but sadda is more like, I don't know, you can't really have a cop made of rubber, but you could have a rubber ball, for example. And if you drop that rubber ball on the floor, it just bounces. So the confidence imparts this sense of malleability, this softness. It, in a sense, starts to melt the heart and it removes that hindrance of skeptical doubt. Yeah, the Buddha defined the hindrances in some places in the suttas as um, impurities <clears throat> that infiltrate gold. So he says there are these five impurities of gold, like copper, steel, tin, etc., lead, maybe one other metal. And this is a simile for the five hindrances. And he says you have to melt down that gold, melt it down, melt it down, melt it down until those impurities fall away. And then the gold is malleable, it's ready and fit for work. And just in the same way, the mind, when it's free from things like skeptical doubt, in this case, the direct opposite of confidence, is brittle, it's stubborn, it's obstinate. It doesn't want to see things that it hasn't yet seen, or it's already made up its mind, you know. And this can happen, and it's one of the dangers when we don't have enough confidence, at least to keep an open heart. <clears throat> Of course, with the Buddha's teachings, there's no dogma involved. The Buddha never said, you have to believe me, you know, when I teach doctrines such as Kamna and rebirth. But he did say, practice to find out for yourself. And so for me, when I hear about some people, say, in secular Buddhist circles who are avidly promoting a doctrine that removes Kamna and rebirth altogether, I feel that this is such a shame, not only for them, but also for the people who will listen and have confidence in them, because you're depriving those people from a path of investigation and a path that remains open until it's able to be verified. We don't need to know more than the Buddha. We cannot know more than the Buddha. And I think there's a certain amount of humility that comes from understanding that there's things we have yet to find out, things we have yet still to aspire to, that there is something to realize. Yeah, there is something to be attained that's not yet been attained. And this is the way that the Buddha speaks. There is something to realize. So it's dangerous to let skeptical doubt overcome the mind because it means that we short, stop short of the goal. You know, we think we're already further on the path than we really are, and then we're not getting the benefits that actually lie that, those few steps ahead. The other problem, if there is not uh, the sense of humility that can come with a mind of sadda, is that we actually change the goalposts to suit our own level of understanding. Yeah. So, for example, there's this one teacher who's written a book and on the front it says his name and then it says the Arahat which is just crazy because somebody who's enlightened never thinks in terms of a being who's enlightened. But he says this on the front cover. And, uh, and he's changed the goals. So he's already decided that he's enlightened. And then some of the chapters say, oh, 
it's not true that enlightened people are free from anger because I still experience anger. So enlightened people can be angry. Enlightened people can have craving. Well, this is very sad to me. I mean, I'm making a joke here, but I actually find this very sad because perhaps this person does have some capacity um, and some love for the Dhamma, but because they've already decided that they're enlightened, they're not going to continue to see how real freedom from the suffering of greed and suffering of aversion would feel. It's not that we're trying to say, you know, it's, it's not good to have anger like you're a bad person or something like this, but I think it should be realized that these things cause us to suffer. And the teachings of the Buddha are all about pointing to where we suffer in an attempt to stimulate in us the wish to be free. And then he gives us a path to walk and says, walk on this path. If you walk on this path, these are the results. And this is why it can be so beautiful to practice with teachers, to practice with each other, to see how we change, how our hearts become softer, become inspired. We develop that sense of humility. We may even develop a very deep devotion, a very deep love for the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. And this comes in its own time. You know, we can't force it just like we can't force those beautiful, well, those scraggly little bushes to turn into beautiful flowers. So trust in your practice, trust in your mind. You've been given a human birth and this is already a huge accomplishment. You know, even animals who are maybe your pets, they're already probably luckier than most animals in this world for being well cared for, for being um, nurtured and fed, for being kept warm. And even they can develop good qualities. But as a human being, we have that capacity to reflect and to intentionally cultivate the good. And this is really wonderful. You know, it doesn't matter how many mistakes we make, we can always pull ourselves back up. So I'd like us to do some meditation now and we will try to invoke some feelings of confidence and trust. Confidence and trust can also be in the meditation process itself, yeah? By putting the causes in place and just learning to trust that the meditation will unfold in its own way and in its own time. So we don't look for anything special. We don't look for a particular result. We just give ourselves this beautiful opportunity to water the flowers of enlightenment inside. So please do shift and wiggle and fidget until you are as comfortable as can be. And here the rain is starting. I don't know if you can hear that, but uh, there are these Velux windows. Actually, it's not a Velux, it's a normal window, but there's this patta, 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 which is quite relaxing. <laughs> so creating a nice atmosphere for yourself. You might want to turn down the lamps. It's lovely to see you all because I can already feel the energy changing, settling, quietening down. And that's partly because we're together. See if you can just tap into that sense of spiritual friendship and support, even with your eyes closed, sensing the other people meditating here on the Zoom room, perhaps also following Facebook Live. Now is the time to stop scrolling and just take some time out.
being alone together. And recollecting that this is a well-worn path walked by so many noble people before us, being walked now by the noble ones among us. Recognizing your own potential, that if you keep walking on this path, you too will ennoble your heart. You too have the chance to see the Dhamma that cuts through greed, all kinds of aversion and delusion at the root of them all. So feel happy that you're now giving yourself this time to put more drops of water in the jar or in the water tank. And just in your own time, gently coming in contact with your body. Perhaps starting this time from the top of the head. A part of the body that usually has pleasant sensations. Although, of course, may experience migraines, headaches as well. See if you can just gently rest your awareness on the skin, the surface of the skin. And sense into any pleasant feeling of tingling or warmth. Maybe coolness. Maybe the soft touch of your hair or your fluffy beanie. And continuing to lightly spread this awareness imbued with kindness across the skin of the face. as though being touched by a gentle breeze. That invites any tension to relax. No need to hold your face. Experiencing any sensations across the ears, the back of the neck and the throat. Remaining open, curious, and very gentle. Exploring the shoulders, areas that often carry so much tension, contracted muscles, maybe sharp pain. Imagining your kind awareness like very gentle breeze or mist, just touching those areas. 
and inviting them to relax. Trusting in this kind awareness to bring about well-being and ease just through knowing and being kind. Spreading through the arms, the elbows, the lower arms, wrists, the hands, fingers and fingertips. Picking up any pleasant sensations without looking for anything special, but just tuning in to whatever comfort and ease is available to you right now. Can be so subtle. But see if you can rest your mind. Moving across the chest. Sensing in to any feelings, any sensations. Whether pleasant or less than pleasant, just being kind indiscriminately. The way that you'd be kind to a child, whether it, that child who's very dear to you, feeling happy or sad. Trusting the power of this kind awareness to heal any disease, any imbalance in the body and also in the mind. Continuing to spread kindfulness across the belly, the diaphragm, and all around the ribs, not leaving any area untouched. The armpits, and also down the back. Keeping that awareness very light and gentle. And exploring the hips, the buttocks the seat of the trunk, even if you experience sensations that are heavy, like pressure, maybe tightness or weight, your awareness can be light. See if that lightness of touch influences the feelings in your body, perhaps giving them space or allowing them to gently relax. Just as a friend relaxes, 
when you give them your unconditional attention, a kind, non-judgmental ear. Moving through and around the thighs. You might find you naturally start exploring more deeply inside the body. But equally, you're welcome to stay at the level of the skin. Just allow the awareness to flow very naturally with no expectation and no demand. If at any time, you feel ungrounded or light, lightheaded or just not quite settled, then see if you can tune in to the feeling of weight, of heaviness, perhaps in the buttocks or in the legs, to get a sense that you're supported by the ground. Allow the ground to do the holding and your body just to relax into that ground held by the earth. And continuing to explore the knees, the shins, the calves. And the feet, the soles, the toes. All the way to the tips of the toes and the area between the toes. Just gently receiving whatever feelings manifest for you. You might not experience anything immediately. But the longer you stay present, the brighter the light of mindfulness becomes. Gladdening and uplifting the mind. Now, if you wish, just gently bringing the whole body or as much of the body as you can sense into your awareness. And imagining if it helps that you're sitting in the presence of someone or something that represents unconditional compassion and love. Allowing your mind to rest more deeply into your inner world.
perhaps a time when you were meditating with a teacher or in a very peaceful place may arise in your mind. See if you can sense into that peace. Bring it into your heart. The peace, the contentment that's available any time. And that peace and contentment can be shy. It may take time to appear in the mind. You've got all the time in the world. Just enjoying the silence between between each. Word. Giving your trust to the silence in the mind. And just allow the mind to incline to whatever feels natural to you. Maybe the silence, the peace. Maybe the feelings in the body. Or you may notice the breath come to mind. All these are just visitors coming to say hello. So see if you can treat them with reverence and respect. Trusting the process of meditation. Even trusting the breath, allowing the breath to breathe you however it wishes to do so. Whether that breath is long or short, 
subtle or coarse. Whether it only stays for a moment or whether you find a resting place for the mind with the breath or with whatever else comes to mind. So we're coming to the end of the meditation, but you are welcome to carry on. Just noticing how you feel now compared to how you felt when you began. And valuing any little bit of peace and contentment that's developed, any sense of confidence, trust in your practice or in the path. Trusting that you are inclining to peace 
if even only for a moment in this whole half hour, or moments of mindfulness, <laughs> moments of trust, of confidence that what you're doing will bring good results. So I'll ring my big gong. Unfortunately, it won't resonate very well in the Zoom setting, <laughs> but you can imagine that it sounds very beautiful. <laughs> and we'll see if we can get a better setting tomorrow. <laughs> I can still hear it reverberating, it's very nice. <laughs> it's about, um, well, I'll show you how big it is. That's pretty big. <laughs> this bell will soon be famous. <laughs> Good, so, ah, I quite enjoyed that myself. Sometimes it's interesting if we use light awareness, the experience tends to be a little lighter. It's a, actually, it's a sort of type of four elements meditation. But in four elements meditation, we experience different qualities of the elements at different times. Lightness is one of the qualities of earth. And some of you might have gone toward the heaviness as well, when just to ground yourself at some point. So now is the time for any questions you may have. And uh, every question is very welcome. Even though I may not be able to answer them all or maybe not satisfactorily answer them, but it's always good to keep a question rolling anyway. <laughs> so if you could please send them to co-host at ah, Q&A Rennie, please. Yes, that will be the um, format so that it's all protecting your privacy. Okay, and the topic of blooming, how to be a good gardener and maintain what grew during the retreat. <laughs> I find myself easily falling back to unwholesome states once I come back to the world. Well, it's a good question, but it's a little too soon because you've only just started the retreat. So <laughs> don't worry about that. You never know what it will be like this time. Perhaps that happened last time, but perhaps it won't happen this time. Each time that you practice, those qualities get deeper and more embedded in the heart, the easier to call back up again. And yet at the same time, I would say that retreat times are the times that we that our flowers get a really good spurt. They get a really good growth spurt and start to bloom more beautifully. So we get a chance to see what's possible. And it's not always possible to maintain that depth and that um, flourishing outside of retreat. But as I said in the beginning, you can develop other qualities and you can develop wholesome qualities based on what you're doing in life. It's of course much easier in a retreat setting because you're protected from unwholesome speech and bodily action more or less, depending what you actually do when the cameras are off. <laughs> but hopefully if you are trying to take part in this the way it's intended and the way we encourage you to, um, you will be developing your virtue throughout the retreat. So that can continue in daily life. And one of the things that helped me a lot was understanding this in-between practice of sense restraint. So this is kind of in between in the sense that it's part of virtue, but it's more like the mental virtue, like the virtue of the mind. And it's a little less, it's a little more active than meditating with sati, than the practice of sati, which tends to be um, 
more in the more about the actual movement of the body what we're doing and why so being aware that we're in the seating sitting or standing or walking posture or the lying down posture and understanding the purpose of that and also of course when you get to meditate noticing the body noticing the mind and the breath but in between that when you're in um, daily life and you're interacting with the world and you're interacting with other people then just see if you can use your opportunities especially in relationship to try to cultivate beautiful qualities like generosity like um, selflessness sometimes compromising what you want to do what someone else wants helping someone out that you didn't really have to help out um serving is very good so now you're sitting in a retreat but later you might consider volunteering to serve on a retreat or you know even in a zoom session or to do some other dharma service that keeps you involved with spiritual friends another aspect of course is to develop wholesome friendships you know to associate with people that are on the similar path and to talk about these kind of problems to talk about the ways that you fall back into unwholesome states and to recognize the causes for that yeah so notice what kind of environments and conditions you're in when these things are likely to happen and see if you can avoid some of those things for example you know if you want to commit to abstaining from alcohol don't go to the pub <laughs> you know if it's going to be too tempting for you to do that of course you can go and ask for water but another aspect of silo is actually sometimes avoiding places that others break their sila as well because it's a different kind of energy and you do get sucked along sometimes so one of the advices that one of my first teachers in nepal told me is okay don't only observe sila yourself but hang around with other virtuous people as well and of course later once i got into the suttas i realized that's a direct advice of the buddha too so the main thing I say is don't worry, but at the same time, make a commitment to practicing the wholesome sides of virtue. So contentment, fewness of wishes, charitable acts, being a good friend to others, maybe healing any sort of rifts that have arisen between you and people who you hold resentment toward. It doesn't always mean that you have to be their friend. It may be that some boundaries required for your own or others' safety. But at least we can work on our qualities internally. And also, I mean, I, I do feel like saying, although I don't want to promote what we're doing, but we have this really lovely sutta class every week. And in there we go through, at the moment, we're going through a chapter on anger and how to deal with anger, how to, um, the kind of thinking that can lead it to arise and that can lead it to kind of uh, get worse and worse and build up into sort of really solid resentments and things like this and um, being in the group is wonderful because it's really a discussion class so people share their own very real experiences in all kind of walks of life their experiences as a, as a mother dealing with teenagers who may be you know full of anger or upset um, people who are dealing with the death of a loved one um, it can be so many different things, people who are dealing with their own fault-finding mind. And it's really reassuring to know that we're all working on this together and that we can keep tapping in to that support. So I would say that's a really important part of it. And also if you can find uh, a group to practice with, you know, to ideally to go to, you know, like we could before COVID, but even online, you know, go to some regular Dhamma groups and uh, inspire yourself like that. You can also try and inspire yourself by reading the suttas, but I think it's nice to do that uh, um, with others. Otherwise, just look for guided meditations, look for sutta talks online. There's so much stuff out there and see if you can make it a habit, you know, so that you know you have something maybe once every few days or once a week that will inspire and give you some support. But don't worry about that now. I mean, it's good that you want to continue developing wholesome states, but now is your chance to really put a lot of fertilizer on your beautiful plants. So how does sending merit work? Is it like sending energy to another being like in meta meditation? Yeah, I would say it is very similar to that because merit, in a sense, is the aspiration to share any results of wholesome acts that we may have done. Um, 
but it's really about sharing the happiness that we experience as a result right it, the merit itself is the happiness you feel in your heart so it's sharing that intentionally with others and imagining it kind of supporting them and perhaps if it's somebody who's passed away imagine it supporting them on their journey you know you actually dedicate the goodness of your life the goodness of your deeds to another person and you know as much as they want they can have it you you know take it all i've heard ajahn brown doing these kind of things and he just says just take everything i have take my life you know and he just gives fully so it's a little bit like uh, that teaching ajahn char gave to the australian monk if you're going to sweep give it everything you've got like if you're going to share merit share all of it and uh, and sharing merit multiplies the merit that's there so it's kind of mysterious i mean i don't know if it actually works i think it might depend a little bit on how um, receptive the person you're sharing merit with is if they're still alive they may well receive it and tell you that they receive it tell you that they experience a sense of support before coming to this um, session I got a very beautiful, very moving email from a friend and um, her brother has just passed away quite recently. And I offered to do some chanting for him, even though he's not a Buddhist. And she said that he's never been a person of faith or had a religion, but just knowing someone was thinking about him really meant a lot. And it also gave her a lot of support to feel that she was able to do something and to have that confidence that it really does make a difference. And I found the message just so beautiful and so moving. And she said it even supported her to have a little bit more intimacy with him before he died. Um, so this is kind of how it works. I mean, I've also asked the monks and nuns in Perth many times to support myself for my own health issues. And also my father who has leukemia and he's on their chanting list every week. Now, I'm sure he would have never even thought about doing something like that. It would have sounded completely bizarre before I became a nun or before I actually introduced him to Ajahn Brown. But now we kind of know each other. They've all traveled together in London. And, and it's really touching for him and for the family. Fingers crossed, he's actually doing pretty good at the moment. And uh, his leukemia has been diagnosed now 11 years ago. So... He is doing pretty well, whether it's a result of the chanting or whether it's a result of being open to the chanting, keeping a more open mind, perhaps a little bit of hope and faith is stimulated in that way. Or perhaps, you know, just feeling cared for by others helps you to care better for yourself. So who really knows? But I think the thing is, it can never, never hurt. And yes, I do think it's similar to meta meditation. I do think so. It's, I mean, sending meta is definitely an energetic thing. If you are feeling sort of sensations, uh, emotions of meta, especially, you can imagine those feelings, those sensations kind of spreading outward. Or if you're a more visual person, you can imagine it as a light spreading outward. And you actually bathe that person in that golden light or whatever color meta is for you. And you picture their face, you know, smiling and soaking it up. You picture them, you remember a time they were happy and you wish for them to feel, to receive your metta as if they were, you know, in that very beautiful state of mind right now. And, you know, even if they don't receive it, they, they feel it when you see them again <laughs> because it transforms your heart. So when you meet that person, it's incredibly unlikely that any sense of ill will will arise and therefore they'll feel safe. So that's also how they receive your metta. Ah, <laughs> I wondered actually if I mentioned four elements meditation, whether I may get a question on that. So I'm not an expert on this. I have practiced four elements meditation on a month long retreat one time. The first part of that retreat, I was really strengthening my samadhi. So I was practicing basically metta and anapana, sort of alternating the two, because I find that metta feeds the breath meditation. Like it also overcomes any hindrances of ill will or boredom. Boredom is a type of ill will. So it prepares the mind really well for the breath. And then just in the last couple of weeks, I practiced a bit with the four element meditation. So the idea of it really is to start seeing the non-self nature of the body. So to break down the body into its elemental form. So the four elements are like earth, water, air, 
and fire. And each of those has a field of sensation. So for example, um, earth element is like the field of weight. So it could be lightness, heaviness, but also texture, roughness, smoothness. Um, there's also, ooh, see, I forget all of them, but earth element has quite a lot. I think it has about eight qualities. And then air element is the field of movement. So like wind moves through the body. So anything that's moving like vibrations or like, you know, the digestive tract is moving, the heart is beating, that's the air element. Um, the fire element is the field of temperature. So hot, cold and everything in between. And the water element is, is fluid, fluidity. And that's a little bit harder to uh, experience. You can experience saliva in your mouth, for example, and that can give you a sense of water. And then you, you kind of connect with that and then experience a similar sensation through the body, or you kind of scan the body, feeling for those types of sensations in the body. And it's quite interesting because as I said at the beginning, uh, at the end of that meditation, if you are focusing on lightness, your perception becomes infused with lightness. If you're focusing on hardness, for example, the body starts to feel very hard. And then the next thing you can do with this is to understand the inside and outside nature of these elements. So for example, when I was meditating on hardness and I was feeling the bones and getting this sense of like hard, hard, nails are hard, lots of things in the body feel hard. Then I opened my eyes and I saw the table and it was almost like much more connection with the table it's like oh just as there's hardness in the body there's hardness in outside too you know in the world and so you would then be much more percipient of all the hard objects in the environment and realize that your body and this hard element in the outside is just one and the same so in this sense it starts to undermine the sense of identification with the body um, and in that way, it can be quite helpful. It's usually considered an insight practice, but it also can lead to upachara samadhi, which is like the neighborhood concentration. Uh, well, that's what they call it in the Abhidhamma and also in the Pali Canon as well. It does talk about upachara samadhi, but the translation is usually concentration, whereas stillness is actually much better to translate it in that way. And I don't only say that because Ajahn's my teacher, it's more that Ajahn's my teacher because I already realized that. And so when I heard his teachings, it was just, oh, this makes so much sense. You know, for years I was trying to concentrate and found it really quite unpleasant. And suddenly when the mind started to settle and get still, it's like, oh, it's not concentration at all. It's a kind of expansive, uh, broad, very beautiful, soft state of mind. So anyway, there's a little bit, but uh, I would suggest if you want to learn more about it, listening to some of Shyla Catherine's talks. She's really great with this and she's a very experienced teacher indeed. She's a lay teacher and you can find her on Dharma Seed, D-H-A-R-M-A, -A. so the Sanskrit, Dharma Seed, but she's a Theravada practitioner. And she's amazing. She's an amazing teacher, very, very experienced in all kinds of meditations, including jhanas. So she will have, I'm pretty sure, some four element meditation recordings. But maybe wait until after the retreat because you won't want to mix it up too much now. It's good to get the best of what's taught here and to give it a, a go. Okay, so don't mix too many things. You've got your whole life. Okay. I sense that the path is the ultimate refuge. However, I still desire to be among nature to experience it viscerally. viscerally. Are these contradictions? No, I don't think they are contradictions because even in the Buddha's day, um, he encouraged us to sit in nature under the root of a tree or in an open space. And there's some very beautiful suttas in the Terigata and Ter Terigata and Teragata, the verses of the enlightened monks and nuns, or the elder monks and nuns, um, where even monks like Venerable Maha Kasapa, who was very austere and quite strict, were writing beautiful, well, saying, speaking out beautiful poetry about these rocky crags and the beautiful little streams and the mosses delight his heart. And he was really enjoying that environment. And that was a support for his meditation. So enjoying nature and finding delight in nature is quite a wholesome happiness. 
of course, it's still the happiness of the senses to an extent, but I think it's a much quieter one than most of the other kinds of happinesses. And I know for myself, the more I practice, and maybe I've always been <clears throat> quite attuned to beauty, I just get incredibly uplifted, energized, and very happy in nature. I just, I just love it, literally love it. And the other nice aspect of nature that Ajahn Brand points out is that it's something that is beyond our control. So it's actually very close to the Dhamma because it cannot really be seen as me or mine. I mean, you can try and garden and say it's my flowers, it's my vegetable patch, but the nature comes along and nibbles it away. So, you know, nature is something that's bigger than ours and something that's quite awe-inspiring. And I think that it's a lovely thing to do. So don't worry. I mean, we're not enlightened yet, so just allow those things to be there and you know one day you might be meditating so deeply that you don't even want to go outside if it happens it happens so that's fine okay I'm just going to check how many messages have come okay not too bad so is it possible to send merit to a person you've never met before but is someone you respect and cherish yes I don't see why not absolutely because um beings are you know can receive I mean, you might not be able to ask that person whether they received it but you'll feel good to do it and that's the important thing you know all these practices are really to overcome greed hate and delusion in our heart and so if that feels like a spontaneous thing to do then please do if you actually want to consider the effects of the merit generally speaking it's probably um, also a good idea to send it to people who really need it the most for example, some people say to Ajahn Brahm, oh, I mean, it's good to say much meta or whatever. I always sign off much meta, you know, to my teacher. But um, but he doesn't actually need my meta. <laughs> like he has superpower meta, right? And so he makes this joke that it's like giving a tenor to a millionaire. And I mean, that's not out of any kind of ego. It's just the fact that his heart is completely purified in loving kindness. I mean, of this, I have completely deep confidence. Um and so, I mean, it's not that I don't feel a lot of metta towards him, but I wouldn't actually feel it's particularly necessary to share my little bit of merit with him. I mean, okay, I've got more than a little bit of merit, shouldn't self-deprecate, but still, you know, send it to people who really need it. And also, yes, you can send it to people if you are inspired, respect and cherish them too. That's quite okay. Can you describe what the what is the difference between concentration using willpower and focusing in walking meditation? Hmm. Um, I'm not sure that it's an either or. Um, the word that you're using for concentration is kind of stillness, but it's also related to sati. So you could also translate samadhi as sustained mindfulness. And it's almost as though the more mindful you are and the longer you're mindful, um, the more the samadhi, the stillness, the, the continuity of awareness increases. So that is your samadhi. So even in walking meditation, we shouldn't really be using our will. It's just that we're learning to develop mindfulness in the walking posture. So we're just aware of whatever part of the body feels easy to be aware of. And that's one reason that I usually emphasize being aware of the moving parts, the feet, and also, if you wish, the legs. And I do think there can be a little bit of a danger sometimes of over-efforting, even in walking meditation, because sometimes you see people, and maybe this is a danger for you, having heard Ajahn Brahm's walking meditation story of how slowly he went, sometimes there's a danger that people start going really slowly, to the extent that their whole body starts to tense and you might not even realize how stiff you've become until you're at the other end of the path. So <laughs> always keep your awareness light and natural and just notice any sensations that arise. Notice the movements in your legs. If you wish, notice the feelings, whatever comes to mind. Don't really focus in and make an effort think of it more like receiving experience than going out to grab it yeah so in that sense I don't think there's really a difference um, the dangerous word there really is the willpower because willpower sort of suggests a lot of wanting 
a lot of um, craving perhaps to be aware of something for a certain length of time. And I think that the whole practice is much more relaxed than that. And one of Ajahn Brahm's latest, uh, not that late, uh, probably several years now, um, slogans is relax to the max. I mean, that's been around forever, I think, but maybe not in meditation. And uh, it sounds a little bit like relax to the max. That sounds kind of pretty basic and not very technical, not very advanced, but it's actually quite profound because it does mean that the more we relax, the more we tend to get out of the way and we give a chance for ease and peace to arise. And I think the other reason it's important to emphasize is because most of us, especially raised in, let's say, neoliberalist, materialistic cultures. We can't only say the West anymore because that's also you know, happening in Singapore, even in India, all over the world. Everything's speeding up. I think it's really um, more the case that we over effort than under effort. You know, if you go to countries like Laos, especially and Northern Thailand, people sit in chairs most of the day. You know, they might do a bit of work in the morning and then you see them after lunch in the kind of deck chair and they pretty much stay there most of the day. And uh, <laughs> I always think of it as like people who are already super relaxed to the point of being a little bit um, lazy. And this isn't only between cultures. I mean, this can be all kinds of human beings, but it tends to be more common in like hotter places sometimes. Um, people that are sort of more on the lazy side need to be told, work hard, work hard, work hard, work hard. And then they get to a level of sort of alert awareness. But people who are already like completely, completely stressed and over efforting, they need to be told, relax, 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 relax. And they get to that level of um, alert awareness, which is somewhere in between. Yeah. So you're aware, but in an alert way. But also, yeah, it's not like you're asleep. So you're alert, but it's just balanced somewhere in between. So see what kind, what type you are and adjust your energy and effort accordingly. <clears throat> so this is great. I'm on the last question and it's the last five minutes. So how far can one go with walking meditation? <laughs> I can see a, a double meaning there. <laughs> you can probably get to the ocean, but not much further, unless you can walk on water. Uh, I don't have much experience, so I'm not sure if when getting some peace and calm, I should sit down and continue. Can you give some guidelines? Yeah, so walking meditation can be really great for developing mindfulness and even developing continuity of awareness because there's more to watch and also for getting quite still. So I would say you can continue with walking meditation for as long as you wish. And if you feel that you really just want to enjoy the peace that, and the mindfulness that's developed, then you can sit down. So there's no, again, right or wrong answer. I mean, I have done walking meditation for as long as three hours at a stretch, only really in one particular monastery where the idea was to stay up all night. So I wanted to use as much time as possible walking <laughs> so that I wouldn't fall to sleep. And that was really interesting. So I was just walking for like three hours and the time actually after a while just slipped away and I was really content and still. Um, but other times if I'm on retreat after a while, like if I'm on a more mm, structured retreat, I don't know, my inclination is to sit much more because for me personally, I seem to develop more awareness and stillness that way. Um, but I find the walking meditation incredibly useful when the mind is still chattering a little bit much or when the mind is just coming out of an activity, say making lunch, or I shouldn't say making, but unfortunately I have to make my lunch sometimes these days because of COVID. But normally I'm being offered my lunch and, um, you know, doing other activities. And then instead of, you know, sitting or even resting straight away, I do some walking meditation as a kind of way of calming the mind down and, and prepare. It's like a transition from one posture to another. So it's a very interesting thing to be able to use in activities of the day. Um, so yeah, just see if you can experiment yourself. Um, sometimes on these kind of retreats, uh, I mean, not our retreat, but some retreats, they sort of 
suggest doing like an hour of sitting or 45 minutes of sitting and then half an hour or 45 minutes of walking and then sitting, walking, sitting, walking. And that's quite interesting too. If you want to have a little bit of an alternation, I wouldn't say necessarily time yourself, but it can be interesting because the walking deepens the sitting and then the sitting deepens the walking, the next walking. So the main thing is your attitude towards whatever you do, yeah? So don't worry too much about how long you do it. Yeah. But if you feel like you're getting peaceful and calm and you just want to sit down, then go for it. Yeah. I've even seen in Jana Grove in Perth that sometimes people put a cushion at the end of the walking path because they get so still that they can barely take another step. So then they just sit and then they stand up again on the walking path and keep walking. So it really depends on you. Okay. So this is a comment from someone on sharing of metta and merit. When doing metta for the neutral unknown person or when sharing, if you meet them in real life on the street or in the store, eye contact and feeling mutual connection is really likely to happen. Yeah, it happened multiple times to me. Also, I think of sharing merit is like putting good energy on the other person's karmic account. Yeah, that's nice. They might not feel it directly, but one day I believe this merit will ripen for them. Very nice. Isn't that lovely? That's a nice way to end. And it also comes back to the point of sadda, you know. We can feel a lot of happiness from giving if we have confidence in the effects of our beautiful deeds. So do it for yourself and hopefully that person will indeed experience it and feel it directly one day. And why not? You know, these things are real. You know, sometimes when we're in the darkest kind of moment of our life, we can really feel, we can sense that we're not alone and that somebody's sending us met, mer, meta or merit. Um, I know that I have definitely felt that before. And who knows when all the thinking mind drops away at the time of death and we're just left with our awareness, you know, moving into the next life without the body and the usual five senses. Who knows what will be there for us? You know, it's almost like an accumulation of everything we've done in this life and also previous lives. So the main thing is to tune into the good. Don't worry about the stuff that's not so good because the general thrust of your life is toward the good. And that's the most important thing, even at the time of death. So very good. And thank you for that comment. Um, it's always nice to hear other people's perspectives on the teachings. and Very inspiring as well. So, I think it's time to say good night, right on time, and uh, hopefully you will have a lovely restful sleep. If you are not sleeping so well, try practicing some metta before you sleep. You know you can't lose out in any way, and you know if you're not going to sleep, great, a better opportunity to keep practicing metta and awareness. So, good night, everybody. Take care. <laughs>